Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching from Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week, we see the kingdom of Israel torn in two as we continue our series, Kings and Kingdoms. You've joined us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif. And I'm reminded of an old Mel Brooks movie where he said, it's great to be the king. You know, he was kind of celebrating, you know, power. It's great to be the boss. But not really. There's awesome responsibilities. And when you mess up, you mess up big sometimes. When you mess up, people talk about it for thousands of years. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth when it's mm. recorded in biblical literature. And we see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Way too much bad and ugly, I think. That's right. We begin Dr. Seif's teaching in Jerusalem. Let's go there right now. These walls are from the Ottoman Empire. Actually, it goes back hundreds of years. And they remind me of the walls around Jerusalem that go back thousands of years. The purpose being, of course, to protect uh, those inside from invasions from outside. Now, one can protect from bows and arrows, but the question on the table today is, what can protect you from your own stupidity? <laughs> I might get some mail for this uh, on the negative side. I say that because Solomon, and rightly so, in biblical literature is construed as the wisest of them all. But if you look at the narration in the literature, it's also evidence that he was the dumbest of them all. I mention that, you know, Solomon comes to power as a made man. His father, David, had accrued wealth expanded empire. Solomon is tasked then with building a temple and more, and he does all that, but he doesn't just do that. Uh, his father David was a man after God's own heart. Solomon's heart drifted. Uh, the book of Ecclesiastes in biblical literature attests to the fact that this man who had everything invested his energies in the pursuit of more. He was acquisitive with goods. He was acquisitive with human beings. He himself uh, gathered a thousand women to himself. I mean, this is a sex addict. Uh, this guy had a lot of problems, spent a lot of money, all these queens, you know, bear princes and princesses. Everybody wants an apartment in the capital city and a Rolex watch. Who's paying for all this? Well, Solomon had a great idea. Let's just raise taxes. Now, think of this for a second. This is indeed a recipe for disaster for a politician, particularly if you're raising taxes just because of your own mistakes. I mention that because when Solomon's life runs its course and his son Rehoboam comes to power, Rehoboam has to pay the piper. We're going to look in uh, 1 Kings chapter 12 and see the story, and it really is something of, of an inglorious story. I mention that because when Rehoboam comes to power, there with his coronation, the people present him and say, listen, uh, we know who your father is, we know the dynasty, and we'll serve you well. We'll serve you, but we want you to lighten the load on us, the tax base on us. He wrestles with it. We're told in 1 Kings uh, chapter 12, verse 13 in Hebrew, Rvaya'az hamelech et ha'am kasha, that he answered the people roughly. Um, this politician wasn't sensitive to his base. 
we're told in verse 15, Velo Shema, that is, he didn't hear. Velo Shema HaMelech Al Ha'am. He wasn't minded to hear from the people. We're told as well when you get to verse 16, when, when the people of Israel saw when the people saw that uh, the king wasn't going to listen to them, uh, they in effect are going to rebel. In verse 19, So Israel rebelled against the house of David. In the aftermath of this, he goes on to give voice to all kinds of evils that enter into Israel as a result of the rebellion. Now, on the one hand, the rebellion is understandable because Rehoboam, and by the way, the word for the king, the name of the king, Rehoboam or uh, Rehavom, means he enlarges the people. Actually, the people didn't get larger under his administration. They got smaller because there was a civil war. Well, his indifference uh, contributed to that, but subsequent to that, things just cascaded out of control. I mention this because the northern kingdom breaks away. They don't just break away from the king. As you go on and read the literature, the Bible says there's no point in breaking away from the king if uh, all the breakaway tribes are going to make their way to the capital city of the king in Jerusalem uh, to go to the temple complex to worship Jehovah there. No, there's going to be a variant form of Jehovah worship. And it is actually uh, despicable in the sense that, well, they build a temple complex and they bring sacrifices there in the northern kingdom. Uh, they do that, but they don't just do that. Interestingly and tragically, they also build golden calves to worship them. And as you might recall, Bible readers, when the people of Israel left Egypt many years beforehand, they said, let's build a golden calf and, 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 and you know, do obeisance to it, and this, this is our God. Uh, they're, in effect, doing that. Again, things spiral out of control religiously, morally, Ethically, we see there's a civil war that, uh, that enacts here because the southern kingdom, uh, Rehoboam's kingdom of Judah, and Benjamin stays there in and around Jerusalem proper and the southern portion of the nation. But then all the ten tribes break away and they form their own kingdom, as we note here, under Jeroboam. We'll hear about him later. And uh, all kinds of evils enter into the world and political intrigue. What can we learn from this, if anything? I light upon the fact that uh, uh, this is indeed quite the tragedy. Uh, Solomon, for as wise as he was, was rather stupid at one level, and his excessive taxation, his son's indifference toward the people uh, contributed to this breakaway. Uh, I think there's lots to learn in all this about how to be a leader today. Would that leaders today actually read about leaders of yesterday, the good, the bad, and the ugly? I think they'd learn something. Well, I hope you learn something too. You want to get behind the right kind of leaders for the right kind of results. We learn this as we consider the story of kings and kingdoms. And so it is in a bygone day. They went their own way. That uh, that, that they did so lent itself to a ruinous condition for the people that went after the wrong kinds of kings. Let's make sure we get the right kind of people in office, not just in our government home, but in our uh, personal homes as well. We want to have the right kind of people leading in our homes, and we want to have the right kind of ideas leading in our domes, that is to say our head. We have to make the right kind of decisions in order to get the right kind of results. Here, there's a story of the wrong kind of decisions, the wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of results, and to lend itself toward the destruction of kings and kingdoms. Baruch Kvasnika is the director of the Jerusalem Seminary, and he's a PhD candidate at Hebrew University, Jerusalem. I caught up with Baruch in order to get his perspective on King Solomon. Baruch, I've fussed at Solomon for too many women, but some of that is necessary, yes? It's true. He had a great downfall because of his heart moving away. He married wives that then he allowed foreign 
deities to come into his heart and the people's lives. Did he need to marry some of those women? He did. He needed the political alliances. He needed the support that's coming from Lebanon, from Egypt, from Aram. All of these were very much needed. So today you make a treaty. Back then you ratified it by picking up a new wife. That's true. And he had many, many, many of them. Yeah, but it wasn't just for political purposes. It got out of control, didn't it? It's very true. He allowed altars to be built right next to the temple, right next to the Mount of Olives. It was the Hill of Destruction mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 11. I guess these foreign wives want to have some of their foreign elements in their world, in their new context, and he gave it to them. He brought those foreign elements into the temple practices. He brought those, and they affected the spiritual well-being of the whole country. Well, there you go. When I think politically, we want to have our leaders with the right kind of mind, the wrong kind of influence in that mind, uh, the consequences can be disastrous. We don't have a lot of time, but what do you think of that? I think that's very true. We have to be so careful of what influences are brought into our life. Solomon brought these foreign deities into his life, and it transformed the whole of Israel for bad, for evil. I fear too much of that is coming into America. Brian, thank you so much for your time. You've heard about fake news. Well, I want to talk to you about fake Jews. Sounds like I'm being cute, but the story's not so funny. But they say start off with a little zinger to get some attention to draw people in. Fake Jews, fake news. I'm coming to you from a place that's not fake, but it's been forsaken. in. That is to say, thousands of years ago, there was a civil war between the North and the South. A coalition of 10 tribes broke away from the Davidic dynasty. And here, they built a fortress, a fortification at one of their main centers in a place called Bet El or Bethel. You'd know that from reading Bereshit or Genesis. Something great happened here in Genesis. Something bad happened here in 1 Kings. Listen, but the bad didn't start here. It started from a noteworthy named Shlomo. It's the word from Shalom, a uh, peace. You know him as Solomon. Oh, he was interested in peace, all right. He wanted to get a piece of this and a piece of that. He wanted to get a piece out of everybody's purse. He taxed people excessively. You know, the family needed the money. He has a thousand women, you know, thousands of princes, princesses. You know, everybody needs their own apartment, their own Rolex, some fancy clothing. Who pays for all of that? Oh, he didn't have an American Express card. He had an Israeli Express card. That's right. He was taxing everybody, and they were paying his bills. And people said, enough already. And the leader of the Enough Already Coalition was a guy named Jeroboam, from a Hebrew word meaning the people contend. He contended all right. Solomon went after him with a vengeance. He ran off to Egypt and married. When Solomon died, when his son Rehoboam came to power, Jeroboam came back and represented the people and said, look, you know, we served you well. Now you need to lessen the tax load. You know, politicians get in trouble with what they do with taxes, how they lean on people excessively to pay for their mistakes. And it happened in Bible days. It happens in modern days. You'll see nothing good came of it but you're not gonna see it right here. I'm going to take you to a place just off to my left. This is a fortification guarding something. Let's now go see what that something is. Now, Jeroboam had a problem uh, with the fake Jews in the Northern Kingdom. What was the problem? Well. They were still predisposed to go to Jerusalem, which was the center of the religion. And not only would they be inclined to cross the border to go worship the God in Jerusalem, but as if that's not bad enough, they're taking the tithe dollars with them. That is to say, money is getting out of the house. Well, we can't have that. If we're going to have a political breakaway, we have to have a religious breakaway as well, but we don't want to make it seem like a breakaway. 
See, Jeroboam had some sechel, he had some smart, so he built this place. And what is this spot? Well, it's a temple at Bethel. Interestingly, it has the same dimensions as the Mishkan, the portable worship facility built by Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses. We're talking about the Israelite, the Hebrew great himself. So they built some sacred space here to mirror that which was at the heart of Judean religion. But in conjunction with that here and far north in Tel Dan, right up at the Lebanon border today, they, they built a sanctuary with a golden calf. You see, Jeroboam had married an Egyptian woman, so let's bring some of the Egyptian religious tradition in the house as well. Let's make it kind of look authentically Jewish in Hebrew, but look, fake Jews. Uh, it's not legitimate at the end of the day, and it has ingredients in it that are antithetical to it. It reminds me of so much of religion today, to tell you the truth. Now, what happens, however, when this guy Jeroboam has a problem, he doesn't seek the fake religion. He goes after one of the prophets who wasn't part of this whole system. He has a sick child, sends his wife and says, listen, go petition him. So she goes stealthily, not with all of her regalia, but he knows who she is because the Lord discloses to him. Interestingly, then, in chapter 14, verse 7, he responds and says, Go tell Jeroboam, thus saith the real God, if you will. No, I'm adding real. It's an interpolation. Uh, uh, you know, thus saith the real deal. He goes on to say then in verse 8 in the middle, you have not been like my servant David. No, that's the truth. Who kept my commandments, who followed me with all of his heart. No, this guy wasn't uh, straight. He was crooked in his heart. Uh, you didn't follow me with your whole heart to do that which was right or straight in my eyes. And then in verse 10, finally, he says, and I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam. No flattery here. We're talking straight. There's a Jewish word, tachlis. Just get right to the point. You know, by the way, in the world in politics, no one likes straight talking. There's a lot of being disingenuous or being flowery. In Latin rhetoric, there's a term panegyria. It, it's how you speak to people with power, to be poetic and flattering principally. None of that here, just right to the point straight talking. There was a problem. Something was sour in River City. And, and the Lord, the God of Israel, knows it. This Jeroboam, over 20 times in the Hebrew Bible, because of all of this, he's referred to as the man who made Israel to sin. It starts off as a political issue, and then it translates into a spiritual one as well. It reminds me, by the way, in so many ways of the world that we live in. Let's learn a lesson and follow the God of Israel. Never mind fake Jews, fake politics, fake religion. Let's go after the real deal. A resource this week, the music CD, Zion Saw. During his lifetime, Zola Levitt composed over 200 spirit-filled songs. Now, David and Kirsten Hart, studio host of Zola Levitt Presents, provide fresh interpretations to 11 of Zola's compositions. Enjoy this beautiful music yourself, or share the CD with a friend. Contact us and ask for Zion Saw. They were uprooted from their home when Jeremiah gave voice to this here in chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. I'm in my home right now, a little hemmed in. I know you are too, and I want you to know as well that we indeed have a future and a hope. Back to the studio now. One of the most spectacular views that I think you could see on an Israel trip is when we go to Jerusalem and we're at the Mount of Olives. It's unbelievable. It's hard to explain. 
we need you to go and join us for a tour. You it's would love it. It's the million it. dollar view. Yes. It's just spectacular. <laughs> and once we're on the top of Mount of Olives, we also have the opportunity to walk as a group, as a family, yes. down the Hosanna Road. I mean, there's just so much. Come with us. We go in the springtime and also on the fall. Levitt.com will give you all the information you need. We want to also say a quick thank you to you, to our viewer, for making all of this possible. You keep our Jewish roots on the air and you keep the good word going literally to the whole world. So thank you so much. Dr. Seif has been teaching on worshiping the true God of Israel. Sarah Lieberman is going to teach us more about praise and worship. Let's go there now. Shalom, chaverim. Welcome back to our series on exploring worship words in Hebrew. As a worship leader, I'm so excited for this series because I know that as you delve in and take on for yourself some of the ways that we are exhorted to worship in the Bible, it will change your life. It will truly change how you interact with God in worship. You see, in English, we have two words, praise and worship. But in Hebrew, we have so many more. And today's word is lehodot. And it comes from the root word toda, which means to say thank you or thanksgiving. Now, so many times in our Bible in English where it says praise the Lord, for example, the heavens praise your wonders, in Hebrew, it actually uses this word toda or yoducha, which means thanksgiving, to come unto the Lord with an attitude of thanksgiving. Now there is a principle in the Bible, and we see it throughout King David's life, that when he is in a hard and difficult place, when he's facing a challenge, he exhorts himself to thank the Lord, to bring an offering of toda to the Lord, and that releases God's victory in his life. Another interesting part of this word toda is that it comes also from the same root that we get the word hand, yad. And so in the Bible, when it says, lift up your hands and praise him in the sanctuary, that's an actual exhortation that we would come unto the Lord with an attitude of thanksgiving, raising our hands to him. Do you know when we open our hands to him, he can put something in them. Isn't that a beautiful image, a beautiful picture of how we worship God with an attitude of thanksgiving in our hearts and raising and lifting up our hands? So next time you're in a worship service, I hope that you take that step to just bring that attitude of toda, thanksgiving to your heart and raise up your hands unto the Lord to thank Him before you see victory. was a song by our founder, Zola Levitt, and you brought it. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, babe. I love singing his songs, yes. If you are just joining us for the first time in the series, we are grading the kings with our professor today. Professor Seif. Yes. Well, I'll tell you what, they're not going to be happy campers because these guys didn't perform very well. Grading always scares me. Yeah, yes. well, I'll tell you, Solomon, I give him an A at the start to tell you the truth. You know, we started off good, but then uh, the apple didn't far, fall far from the tree uh, like his father David. Uh, he had too many women. I mean, David had too many women, just shy of 20, but Solomon just, oh my goodness gracious. And, you know, administratively good, sage insight, but he ruined it all. And that's evidence in the next generation as well. His son, Rehoboam, I mean, here we go from A to D. He just goes from F 
to F minus. No. I mean, he's a worthless piece of human wreckage. You he, know? I mean, he was born born of the wisest man ever. Yeah, Isn't that he, crazy? I don't get it. Yeah, but I'll tell you that he didn't inherit it. You know, he was indifferent toward legitimate complaints of his people. He he lived in the palace. He, he was indifferent to those in the streets. And that was his undoing. There was a civil war. And this guy, Jeroboam, I'm going to give him an F as well. Wow. Uh, you can tell I'm a tough teacher, but the Bible's tougher yet. This guy was a labor leader, kind of like a blue-collar organizer. Uh, during, Rehob during Solomon's administration, there was a lot of discontent. Rehoboam made it worse. Street level, Jeroboam capitalized on that and facilitated a revolt and a breakaway. We have two parties with God's people, two perspectives, two camps, breakaway. They live in different worlds, uh, kind of like today in so many ways. These guys are kings. You would think they'd have a perfect life. People underneath them. They're but royalty, right? Look at and, the yeah. very beginning to where we're at right now. Well, they sometimes, all have problems. And the problem is sometimes people just get into being the king. I mean, it's, you know, Jesus spoke about there's, there's words for king, there's majesty, and there's ministry. He says, they lord it over them in the secular culture, but not so among you. Uh, it's imperative for the people at the top to serve those down into the pyramid, but sometimes people just enjoy it too much at the top, and we see too much of that they, here. They lose the humility. And I think Solomon started out good, right? You gave yes. him an A. He started out, and he inquired of the I mean, the Lord said to him, what do you want? And he said, I want wisdom. And then just, it's just sad how it, how his life ended. Yeah, he wanted women too. This I guy know. was a sex addict. Yeah. And it was his undoing. Wow. There's got to be some good news, though. Yes, we're going to have good news coming. We'll, we'll get to Jesus, but I'll tell you <laughs> the truth. If you look at what the Bible says about those who were leading, it's very unimpressive. That's why I look to the King of Kings very much so. It's sometimes very unimpressive when you look at the kings. We have so much more coming in our series. Come back next week. Watch us online. But until then, Pastor Seif. Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store, there, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministry.